tell me where you're from and maybe a little bit about yourself too. As you, okay, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I'll let, I'll let the, the mic, how about for the mic bearers make the decision? Okay, all right, okay. Um, so um, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Kevin from Georgetown University. And um, my question for you is that from your years in the government, do you think people at the highest level are, you know, uh, lack of framework of analysis you describe? Or rather, they have you know different interpretation of historical evidence, or you know they have um, different metaphysical assumptions about you know how the world works, or whether you know they just have you know they have to act in, in in times of uncertainty, you know, based on like imperfect intelligence. Yeah. Hey, I think all of that is true. So so I I think what happens oftentimes in Washington is that that uh, those who are serving across administration, maybe especially in the White House they lose their long-term focus, and they get mired in re reacting, reacting to, uh, to what's happening in the world, uh, or they get mired in tactics, right? And I think a lot of times you get, mar you get marred in tactical decisions and you centralize authorities and decision-making, oftentimes as a poor substitute for strategy. And now, guess what? Now you're always short-term. You're dealing with tactics. You're dealing with authorities and, and discrete decisions instead of having a, a broad strategy that everybody understands and that allows you to implement that strategy and continue to assess it. So I'll, I'll give you an example. I'll, just, I'll tell you, first of all, I recognize that this was the case when I came into the, to the White House. The, fir the first thing I did is I inventoried all of the decisions and authorities that had been centralized by the previous administration. And then I prepared memoranda for the president to, to, uh, to, to give those authorities and decisions back to the departments and agencies to just get us out of, people were asking me for permission to do stuff. Well, can we sail these vessels through the South China Sea? I'm like, why are you asking me? You're the, you know, you're the Department of Defense, man. I mean, you know, I mean, what, what, maybe we should come up with a, a strategy for how to deal with China's laying claim to the ocean, right? And then, and then trust you to do whatever the heck you want to do, you know? Um, that, that you think is, is consistent with that, with that strategy and, and policy. Another example I'll give you, though, is, is the support to Ukraine. So we, we hear this, this phrase, as long as it takes. What is it? What is the objective in Ukraine? Is the objective that Ukraine is a, is a viable state uh, that is on its way to recovery economically, that can secure itself uh, well into the future? And what is, what is the end state we're trying to achieve? I think that's what it is. Okay, now if that's the case, what, what has to happen to get to that political and economic end state? What has to happen militarily? Well, I think that Ukraine has to be able to take back all of the territory uh, that, that, uh, that has been taken from it since 2014. And I think at, at very least, the Crimean Peninsula needs to be neutered uh, from a, a military perspective. Now, if that's the case, then you can start having a conversation about you know, what is the capacity and capabilities that that the Ukrainian military needs. And then you're not debating, well, should we give them tanks or not tanks? What kind of tanks should we give them? Should we give them F-16s? Should we provide tiered and layered air defense? How about long range precision strike? How long range? Yeah, I mean, I mean it's just, it, these, these tactical discussions are meaningless. Think about how many times in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, people kept talking about troop caps and troop numbers, and is it 4,500 or 7,000? I mean, really? Why are we talking about that? Why aren't we talking about what is it we're trying to achieve and what is the strategy right, that, that, that will, will allow us to achieve those objectives? And then, hey, what are the, what are the resources that, that we need? So I think, to answer your question, we get mired in the, in the short term and we get mired in, in tactics. So what, what I did, and this, is, uh, you know, this was dismantled by my successor, but <laughs> when I became National Security Advisor, I, we came up with 16 first order challenges. And then we organized framing sessions around those challenges. Those framing sessions began with consideration of a five-page paper. I limited it to five pages, right, because you're at the executive level. Now, the intelligence agencies, they'll have, like, huge annexes to it. Annex A is, like, 80 pages. You know, that's okay. The five-page paper was framed in kind of the way that I, I showed you, right? So it was a discussion of, hey, what's the, what's the challenge we're facing, right? What's the nature of it? And, and these were all based on questions, right? The priority was, the priority was communicated in the, in the way of a question. How to stabilize Iraq and ensure that Iraq is not aligned with Iran, okay? Some of them were longer, right? You know, <laughs> I, I mean, how to stabilize uh, Syria uh, in, in a way that, that allows us to, to have the enduring defeat of ISIS, 
doesn't empower Iran, right? And, uh, and so, so you, th you start thinking about what are the, how do you frame the question? How to, you know, how to, uh, how to defend against Chinese economic aggression and other forms of aggression uh, and prevent China from establishing exclusionary areas of primacy across the Indo-Pacific region uh, and, and, uh, and undermining uh, you know, the security and economic frameworks that are, that are critical to American security and prosperity. So, so you have these, these first order questions and then we would have this discussion around the framing. The first, the first part of that meeting was only about you know, the framing. Do we have this right? The second part of the meeting was, was about, okay, what can we do? What can we do to integrate all elements of national power and efforts of like-minded partners uh, to, to advance our objectives? So the framework, the framework in this paper was, okay, nature of the problem, what we think the problem is. The second was, okay, given what are our vital interests that are at stake? Why do we care? What's the so what? The third is, what is an overarching goal and what are more specific objectives? Draft again, right? The fourth is, what are the assumptions under which this, this policy would be based? And then, and then the final section was, what are the obstacles to progress, right? We know we want to go there, but what's impeding us from getting to where we want to go? And then, and then what are the opportunities that we can exploit, right, to, to, to accelerate progress toward objectives? And then the second part of the meeting was a question back to the principals. Hey, how do we? How do we overcome these obstacles? And how do we, how do we take advantage of the opportunities? And then you get like that top-down kind of guidance. And the policy coordinating committee, which is kind of the assistant secretary level, they're listening in the overflow room to the situation room, and they're taking it. Now they've got something to go with. Then I had something to bring to the president and said, hey, Mr. President, here's, here's the way we're understanding this challenge from China, from Russia, whatever it is, in space, in cyberspace, because many of these were functional challenges. And here's what we think our goal ought to be. Here are the assumptions we're kind of, what do you think? He's like, oh, okay, general, you know, whatever, right? So then uh, you, know, you have something to send out to the government to say, okay, start, start changing course, right? We have, a, we have the foundation for a new policy. Now, the next step then was I asked the team to develop multiple options for what would become an integrated strategy, right, consistent with that framing and these ideas. And I think that's an important step as well, is to show a president, you know, any executive leader, multiple options, because that's the person who has to make the decision. And it's in the comparison of those options that you can draw out kind of the risks and the mitigating measures and the degree to which they, they compare to one another in, in terms of resource allocation, risk, and so forth. And that, but the, so sadly, that process doesn't happen uh, very often in Washington. I'm going to let the mic microphone bearers pick. And then what we'll do is we'll do, how about if we do like, th I think I can remember three questions in a row. How about if we just go, we'll just go like across three questions? And then I'll ask you to remind me after I answer the first one, probably. Okay, go, go ahead. We'll go left to right, cross. Whoever hey, has uh, a mic, okay, we can go right to left. My name is Ayush, thank you right. for the talk. Um, you mentioned inaction and indecision. I'm curious if you have a framework for getting through analysis paralysis and actually taking action. Getting through analysis and taking action? Yes, analysis paralysis, and then yeah. actually getting to some sort of a decision and taking yeah. action. Right, okay, all right, okay. Does anybody have a pen up here? I can borrow a pen, I was gonna write these down. Thank you, thanks a lot, appreciate it. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Gianna, I'm from Liberty University. Um, thank you so much for your talk. Kind of one of the, um, the best books that I wrote, I read to um, kind of understand the US-China hegemon race was The 100 Year Marathon by Michael Pillsbury. Yeah. Um, and kind of his outline of China's strategy to kind of have global dominance. And I was wondering your thoughts on, has the United States kind of made any headway um, or made any progress in disrupting China's mission to become the world hegemon and maybe what strategies have contributed to that disruption? Okay, great. Rappaport. Uh, my question is, what are your thoughts on the Biden administration abruptly backing out of Afghanistan? Do you consider that strategic competence? Okay. All right. Thank you, General. My name is Charles Stalzer, Georgia Tech, Hillsdale College, former Air Force. Uh, I recently watched the Firing Line episode where you discussed with William F. Buckley your book, Dereliction of Duty. 
And I'm wondering to what extent, if any, the same line of criticism you advanced towards the Vietnam generation of leadership also applies to the war on terror general, uh, generation of leadership and your assessment of civil military relations more generally. Okay. All right. Great. Wow. Am amazing. Amazing questions. Okay. So, so analysis paralysis and, and, and uh, you know, being paralyzed by kind of potential risks, you know, that, that's, all, that's always a danger in, in, in bureaucracies. And the, really the key thing is to, to always challenge your team to try to, to try to um, explore and describe the risk of inaction. You know, Dr. Kissinger said, you know, in Washington there are always three options, right? There's always capitulation, you know, nuclear war, and the option that you want, right? So, but, but, but you, try, you try not to do that, right? You try to make all the options uh, viable, you know? And, and, uh, and so I think it's, off, it's often much easier, right, to kind of quantify or to understand the risk of action. And often we, we don't talk about the risk of, of, of inaction. I think that's one way systematically to, to do it. Um, so the, the second is, of course, because I didn't bring my glasses here, so I know I can't read my, okay, 100-year marathon China competition. So um, that's, a, that's a great book, by the way. Uh, I think there's some others that, that are really, for context on China, are really uh, good to read. Uh, both of Elizabeth Economy's recent books are, are, are superb. Like, uh, Roche Doshi's book uh, called The Long Game. Uh, shows really the designs of the party over time. If you're looking for a quick beach read, uh, there's a book called Spies and Lies about the United Front Work Department and the big lie that you know China was going to liberalize, you know, and 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 uh, and how you know, this has really been a deliberate uh, effort on on China's part. And then if you just want like a magisterial work of of uh, uh, of America's relationship with China over the centuries. There's John Pomfret's book, uh, which is phenomenal, called the the, uh, the Beautiful Country in the Middle Kingdom. But there's there's a lot of great work. I mean, I'm, I'm you know there's plenty of others uh, out there to read too. In my book, I've got a recommended reading list actually in the back of the book uh, for each for many of these challenges. But uh, but so uh, you know what what. Uh, what, what I think the assumptions were, as I mentioned, that underpinned our, our policy and strategy were, were, was this policy, that, the strategy that, or the, the assumption that China would liberalize. So we rejected that, and we put into place a, a transparent competition strategy, is what we called it, uh, in 2017. And that has carried through now across two administrations. Uh, I believe that, that it, is, it is effective, uh, and it is starting to be effective in terms of recognizing uh, the degree to which, especially China, has weaponized its status mercantilist economic model against us. Because we had failed to recognize that for so long, we had vacated critical arenas of competition uh, that, that China remained on uh, and, 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 uh, and were, were able to, to gain uh, advantages over us uh, from you know, technology theft, sustained industrial espionage, um, economic policies that were not reciprocal in terms of access to their market, the forcing of joint ventures for our companies, such that we had to transfer our know-how and intellectual property to Chinese companies, which could then pick a winner from a Chinese company, subsidize that company, shut you out of the China, Chinese market, and then dump goods, you know, hardware, equipment, whatever it is, on the international market to drive you out of business completely, right? This is what Huawei did. This is what solar panel manufacturers did, wind turbine manufacturers. It's about to happen to Elon Musk and Tesla, even though apparently he doesn't, hasn't figured that out yet and he's a genius. I mean, he should know better. Um, it happened in battery manufacturing already. Uh, so so, so there, there, there was like, we finally acknowledged, I think, kind of the full range of this competition, uh, including you know, many other areas. So we, we, we characterized the competition uh, with China as, as China really using these strategies against us of, of military civil fusion, made in China 2025, Belt and Road uh, Initiative, as, as the three C's, co-option, coercion, and concealment. What China does is they co-opt you, right, it, it, with false, false promises of impending liberalization, right, uh, they, and, and, uh, and, and co-opt you by saying, well, you know, if you turn a blind eye to what we're doing, like with this genocidal campaign against the Uyghurs, you know, maybe we can work with you on climate change. You know? Well, who's the problem on carbon emissions? Uh, it's China, you know? I mean, so I just think that, that, that we've deluded ourselves by, by allowing them to co-opt us. And then, and, then, and then coercion. Once you're in, once they've got you, okay, now we are dependent on them for some critical supply chains. Right, Germany, Europe, they should have, you know, one of the big lessons is it's really bad, silly, dumb, whatever you want to say, 
to give an authoritarian, hostile power, coerc coercive power over your economy. Uh, we've done that uh, with supply chains that are, that are wholly dependent, critical supply chains uh, on, on China. Uh, and then what China does is they conceal all of this coercion, whether it's in, in setting debt traps for com com countries and so forth. This is just normal business practices, right? You know, so, so there's nothing to see here in Xinjiang. You know, there's no forced labor. We don't have people in re-education and concentration camps. So I, I think we allowed ourselves just to fall into that. Finally, we've woken up to it. Is what we're doing now adequate? No, to answer your question. There's much more that we need to do. Hard power matters in deterring China. I think we have not done enough to invest in the military capacity and capabilities to, to demonstrate clearly to the PLA they can accomplish their objectives through the use of force vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan or in the South China Sea. We haven't done enough to compensate for the, the economic position of disadvantage that we've been put in by, you know, by vacating these, these critical battlegrounds. We need a, a holistic approach to economic statecraft that doesn't surrender our advantages associated with our free market economy or our unbridled entrepreneurialism but at the same time counters their, their mercantilist uh, status model. And this is a combination of tools that should be used in, in a way that's integrated. And this is you know, uh, export controls, it's outbound investment screening, which we just had a very weak executive order uh, on. It's invigoration of inbound investment to make sure that those investments don't result in the transfer of critical technologies and intellectual property. It is, it is, it is also, um, a range of investments maybe in critical sectors where we have to kind of catch up and, and, and get over some of the barriers to re-entry into these markets. This is especially in, in microprocessors, microelectronics, but there are other sectors affected by this uh, as well. I mean, we don't make any magnets in the United States anymore. You know, we have a real problem with battery supply chains. Uh, and, then, and, then, and then also, you know, and it doesn't have to be in the United States, right? This could be, you know, just re we, we need a, an effort to, to make supply chains more resilient. Right. And then and then also we have to deal with human capital right? to, you know, to try to to try to invigorate our advantages there. And this could be with the changes to immigration policy. I mean, I do think if you get a graduate degree, you know, in, in, a, in a critical area here in the, in the United States, you ought to have a, 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 a work visa, you know, an H-1B visa stapled to it, you know. Uh, but also, I think educating our own people. I mean, I, I just think that there, there's a lot we, we need to do. Um, and, and across all those areas. So, so I, think, I think it's happening, that competition is happening, but we haven't really taken it on with the sense of urgency that's, that's required because we're just so far behind, you know? And, and, then, and then I think on, on Afghanistan, Afghanistan's heartbreaking for me, you know? I mean, I, I, uh, I think it was, I would, the ways I would describe it is self-defeat. We defeated ourselves in Afghanistan. Uh, a, Pakist a Pakistani ISI, Inter Services Intelligence General, agreed, right? He said, in the 1980s, uh, I, worked with the, I worked with the United States uh, to defeat the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. And now I've worked with the United States to defeat the United States in Afghanistan. And, and what, that, what that shows you is how deluded we are on, on our strategies, um, it, strategy in, in Afghanistan, and, and, um, and, and how we kidded ourselves about the nature of the enemy, which I, which I, I mentioned, but just think about what you heard about Afghanistan all the time. Hey, there's no military solution in Afghanistan. Well, the Taliban came up with one, didn't they? You know? And then if you think about really what led up to, to the collapse in Afghanistan, it was actually the blows that we delivered to the Afghans on our way out. If we were gonna leave, why the heck didn't we just leave? When President Obama made, I think, a really bad decision, and it's clear in retrospect, Respect, to leave completely Iraq militarily in 2010, we didn't negotiate with Al-Qaeda and say, is it okay with you if we leave on this timeline? I mean, what the heck were we doing? So we, we negotiated with the Taliban without the Afghan government. What does that do to the legitimacy of the Afghan government, right? Cuts them out of it. What else did we do? We stopped supporting the Afghan security forces actively with intelligence collection uh, and with air support and other, and other means of support. We, uh, we, we withheld uh, logistic support uh, from, from Afghan security forces. We forced the Afghans to release, you know, uh, 5,000 of some of the most heinous people on earth and then do other prisoner releases during this negotiated, uh, you know, with, withdrawal. Uh, and, and then what did the Taliban do with all that, right? They, they went around to all the provinces and they went to all the military commanders. They said, hey, the Americans are leaving. Um, 
you know, this is, the Taliban is part, they've got a huge back end here, right? They've got the ISI, they have donors in the Gulf, uh, they have the Haqqani network, the, Al the Al Qaeda brigade that took over the airport in, 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 Ka in Kabul. And they said, here's how it's going to go down. Either you accommodate with us when we give you the word, or we kill you and your whole family. What is it going to be, basically? Right? So, so we, it, we essentially helped defeat the Afghan government and security. We partnered with the Taliban against the Afghan government and security forces. It was an astounding degree of, of, of moral failure uh, and, and, and extraordinary incompetence. You know? um, so, uh, and the final question, I wrote a book, Dereliction of Duty, how, how and Why Vietnam Became an American War. And I do see a lot, a lot of parallels and failures that, that, are, that, are, that are similar to that, especially with a president. Presidents can get the advice they want, right? And, and I think the case maybe with uh, President Trump, although it was not, no longer the administration, but I think it's quite clear from the accounts in the Biden administration's uh, decision making, the President Biden had made his decision. And no matter what anybody told him, he wasn't gonna consider anything else. Um, basically, when he was vice president, he had said to, that the military was boxing in President Obama. Well, what, how were they boxing him in with their advice? They were telling him ad, advice that he didn't want to hear. Is that boxing in the commander in chief? No, it's actually necessary to challenge uh, predilections of, de of decision makers and policy makers uh, if, if you're going to make the best decisions. So I think what he did is he said to the military when they said, well, really, uh, do you really want to evacuate the military before we evacuate civilians? You know, uh, d does it make sense to close Bagram airfield? Because if we do that, we're in this, this single airport that's butted up right against an urban area and is utterly indefensible, you know? All those questions were raised. And, and military leaders were told, hey, shut up. This is what I told you to do. And that's what we do right, in the military, right? Nobody elects generals to make policy. That policy-making uh, responsibilities with the commander in chief and, and, and with the Secretary of Defense in your chain of command. And, and so once you gave the US military a number of troops and a date, there was no option but to close Bagram. There was no option to kind of set us, ourselves up uh, for what is a, an ongoing catastrophe is what I would say it is. So, and then you also heard there were no viable alternatives, right? We had, we had maybe, you know, if we if, if a sustained military commitment in Afghanistan would probably be about 5,000 troops maybe 10,000, but, but what, how, how significant would that be? About $22 billion a year? That was sustainable. We've incurred much more cost, I think, in many different forms uh, than, than what a, a sustained commitment would have cost there. And of course, you'll, you'll hear the argument, well, you know, Afghanistan, it's, you know, we failed. It's not Denmark yet. It wasn't Denmark, you know? It didn't need to be Denmark. Afghanistan just needed to be Afghanistan. It was gonna be, still be a violent place, but it, a violent place with a government and security forces who were hostile to the enemies of all humanity, you know? So um, that's my perspective on it, but I think, it's, I think there are parallels to the failures of, of maybe of decision-making and, and uh, making decisions, in this case, on Afghanistan on a flawed set of assumptions, really self-delusion. Retooled a lot of its bureaucracy um, and re-examined the sort of intelligence community, um, looked at its development uh, sector as well, um, and there was a lot of bureaucratic change that uh, took place um, yeah. in response to sort of a new strategic challenge uh, that was identified. Um, now that we're sort of moving into this era of uh, great power competition, uh, is there additional uh, sort of bureaucratic change that needs to happen um, to sort of retool um, our yeah. uh, bureaucracy for this challenge? Or do you think it's uh, sort of, you know, everything's all set and we just need to yeah. reset the strategy? Okay, all right. Yeah, really interesting question. I think what we've done is we've said, okay, we're just, never, we're just not gonna do this stuff again, you know, in terms of sustained commitments abroad. Um, like in Afghanistan or in Iraq where we still are and in Syria uh, because we just got tired of it, you know, but our enemies haven't gotten tired of it. You know, wars don't end when one side disengages. And we are fighting enemies who do want to inflict tremendous harm on us uh, at a time when I think they, they are becoming a greater danger. Maybe even these groups are becoming more dangerous than they were on 9-11. And the reason why we haven't had another 9-11 is because we are sustained, we have sustained engagement abroad, mainly working through partners 
uh, who, who keep these, these uh, terrorist organizations from being able to gain control of territory populations and resources that they can use to become much more effective. If you, if you really look at the situation now, you have uh, a terrorist organization in charge of a nation state. Uh, you know, Haqqani is, is the Minister of Interior in Afghanistan. He's the person issuing passports. Just that the territory and the resources available to them and in, in Pakistan and through Gulf donors and others uh, are significant and are making those organizations much more potent. And by those organizations, I mean those that are sponsored directly by the Pakistanis like Lashkar-e Taiba, uh, but, but also Tariqi Taliban Pakistan, which has kind of turned against the government, uh, the Taliban, the Haqqani Network, Al-Qaeda, and ISIS Khorasan, which is tied to ISIS groups that now go all the way across uh, the, the, the Maghreb and into North Africa and into West Africa. Um, and these, these groups are networked, which makes them more dangerous. They're able to, they're able to transfer know-how in terms of uh, destructive capabilities. And you have this dynamic, kind of, what some people have called the democratization of destruction, where non-state actors are gaining access to destructive capabilities previously associated only with nation states. And uh, Audrey Cronin's book is quite good on this called Power to the People, in which she, she, uh, she looks at the technologies and, and the degree to which they're, they're, they are um, transferable to jihadist terrorist organizations. But I think because of the, of the, you know, the, the debacle in Afghanistan, you know, the narrative of the, of the Middle East just being an, a, a mess to be avoided, we're in a period of profound retrenchment and disengagement, uh, which I think is, is, is going to make the, those groups much more dangerous. I think the situation that we're in is analogous to the post-Vietnam period. We said, okay, we just never want to do that again. There's a, there's a very good essay by a historian, Conrad Crane, called Avoiding Vietnam. And I think what we're doing now is we're just avoiding really what we have learned, what we should have learned in Iraq and Afghanistan. And we're just erasing that from our memory. And now we're going to go to something we're much more comfortable with, you know, great power competition, you know, and, and even myopically defined as happening really from the, Mal the Straits of Malacca to, North e to Northeast Asia. This is the, this is the um, Bridge Colby, you know, argument that we should all go play little kids soccer and just, just run over uh, to the, to the Indo-Pacific region and forget that this competition is happening actually in the Middle East, uh, happening in the Black Sea region, happening in, in, our, in our hemisphere, in the Western hemisphere, so uh, in, across Africa. So um, I, I do think that, that, that there's an, an analogy to that, that post-Vietnam period, and, um, and it's gonna be a setup, right? I mean, it's gonna be a, a setup, I think, for more strategic surprises that we'll have to adapt to again, and say, oh, I guess maybe we really do have to stay engaged. But if you, if you look at really, even, even our, we disengaged from Somalia and said, wow, uh, maybe I think we may have to go back. We went, went back, right? You saw the recent strikes in, in Yemen, uh, for, for example. I mean, these, these groups uh, are not just gonna give up. And that doesn't mean that that's the long-term solution is the military engagement. There's a, there's a whole cycle that we have to break that we could talk more about if you want. But, um, you know, but I, I think that we're talking ourselves out of having to remain engaged against jihadist terrorist organizations that are a threat to us and all humanity. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank you for that wonderful yes. presentation. Uh, my name is Salvador Reyes. I am from the University of the Pacific here in Stockton, California. Um, so during your presentation, you were talking about uncertainties with intelligence and logistics. Um, from my understanding of the situation, the United States made plans to leave Afghanistan during the Trump administration, and then that motive was carried over during the Biden administration. I'm interested in hearing your thoughts about this question. Question. Did the United States have the capabilities to get most or all of our military equipment out of Afghanistan during the rough exit of American forces outside of the country? Okay, the answer to that question is no, uh, because there was a vast amount of equipment there. Uh, and, and when you surrender, uh, that's what happens to your equipment. I mean, that's what we did. And I think you're right to point out that this occurred over two administrations. Uh, the, the Trump administration presided over, I don't know what else to call it, but a, a surrender ceremony in Doha, Gutter in February of 2020. And uh, 2021, no, 2020, February 2020, right? No, 2021, I can't remember. Anyway, um, and this, this is where Secretary Pompeo went to, to, to Doha, Gutter. Uh, and, and I think that, you know, 
The Biden administration, though, said, well, we had to stick to that agreement. Okay, well, they went back into the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal, right? They rejoined the Human Rights Council. They, they, did a, they reversed a lot of Trump policies. They could have reversed that one. So I think the, the, the after action reports from the Biden administration are profoundly embarrassing. They're just a whitewash effort. Nobody's really paying any attention to it. But the responsibility, as you point out, is shared across both administrations. And again, there's a point at which kind of, you know, Republican Party, I don't even know how to describe it. Alt-right, I don't know what that means really. But, but you know, there's a neo-isolationist wing of the Republican Party of conservatives that at some point, right, and this is kind of a nativist uh, retrenchment movement, there's a point where it meets kind of the, the self-loathing ideology of, of, the far, of the far left, you know, and, and, uh, and their arguments are often indistinguishable, you know. I, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I think that, that really the, the argument ought to be for sustained engagement. You know, not, we're not going to be the world's policemen, solve problems in the world. But I think what we should have learned from 9-11 is that, is that you know, problems and, and challenges to our security that develop abroad can only be dealt with at an exorbitant cost once they reach our shores. I think that's true for terrorist organizations. It's true for you know, pa great power rivalries uh, in terms of look at the strategic forces that China is building up now. If you look at the threat of nuclear war, for example, you know, that people are concerned about escalation on, on, in, in, in the Black Sea or basically Ukraine, well, we wouldn't be talking about it if that war was prevented to begin with, right? If, it, if Putin had been deterred by maybe a forward uh, presence of more capable Ukrainian forces, certainly. Uh, and then it's true for pandemics, right? I mean, why, why, why do we have the pandemic? Because the epidemic grew into a pandemic thanks to the Chinese Communist Party and everything they did to obstruct any efforts to identify it early and, and, maybe, and maybe contain it. Uh, so so I, I just think that, that, our, that the argument that we need to have is against the sort of impulse toward retrenchment and disengagement and what a sustained internationalist approach to foreign policy looks like, right? We know that the soft-headed cosmopolitanism, you know, and this idea of an international community, right? I mean, I don't want to burst anybody's bubble, but it doesn't exist. There's no such thing as international community. Like, whenever you hear that, you should just say, that's a figment of somebody's imagination, right? We are in a competitive global environment, and that doesn't mean that has to lead to conflict, but it means that if you don't compete, right? I mean, if uh, you don't mind me using the vernacular, if you don't compete, you get your ass kicked. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, so it's, it's important to recognize the nature of the competitions and to be able to integrate uh, all elements of national power in, in a sensible you know, way. And that's, I think, the essence of strategic competence. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>